you know you can was the saying lead the horse to water. you can lead, lead the horse to the water but you can't drink for it <laughs> we are thirsty there's a posse as a matter of fact the Rebbe the Alter brings it down in, brings it down in Tanya called Tzomei Luchul Amayim if you're thirsty, go to water. And uh, the Bosik actually refers to thirsty, a spiritual thirst. If you feel dry in your soul, L'chul Amayim, go to the waters, because Torah is called waters. central topic for today's talk that I hope to to present to you hopefully will be helpful for you in a practical level is to understand the concept of what's called Avoidas Hashem Avoidas Hashem means serving Hashem And um, when you start analyzing these words, you say, what do you mean serving Hashem? What kind of service does Hashem need from me? And how am I serving Him? How am I serving Him by davening and learning, doing mitzvahs? In what way is this a service to Hashem? If I do a good deed, I'm... At best, I'm serving another human being. I'm doing a good, a good thing. But where is what is the meaning of serving Hashem? <clears throat> we are coming from a background. where we think of ourselves as a an independent an individual who is entirely unto himself and if he should be of any value to in in a general sense to the rest of the world he has to prove himself he has to be creative he has to do something that will, will leave a mark on the, on the rest of on the whole world otherwise he is only fulfilling himself And we will discuss in a moment where this is coming from, but just to present to you a completely different view, and then we'll understand the, the difference and the contrast. The Torah view is quite different. The Torah tells us that when Hashem created Odom, Odom was created in a manner different than all other creatures and all other animals. Just the sequence of events, the manner in which it was created was totally different. All animals, even the animals, let alone the lower levels of creatures, even the animals were created body and so, 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 quote unquote. Now, was their life and their physical existence simultaneously as one entity? Mm-hmm. 
the life of an animal and the life of a tree, although they're, they're in different, different classes, but there is a great similarity between them. The life of the tree consists in the fact that the tree grows and it grows by feeding off from the food from the ground and and the sunlight that's its life it does not have a life independent of its body an animal its life consists in the fact that it can move around from place to place. It's a balchai. It's, an, it's a, the next stage. It's a, a separate category. It's a higher category than the plant. But its life also consists in the fact that it can move around, <coughs> find its food, and eat, and take care of, of its needs. That's the question. Yeah, that's the nature. That's the nature. Yes, that's the nature, and that's <coughs> all it is. So it's been the nature is being the, the kind of life, the, the service of Hashem is about our nature. Well, wait, I'm, I didn't come to the service of Hashem. That's <laughs> the human being. In some kind of way, the animal is serving to Hashem. That's why that we have to do because that it's it's nature. Right? No, no, wait, wait, wait. <coughs> I'm going to come to defining what it means by serving Hashem. Serving Hashem in the in the real sense of the word that we are referring to is exclusively for the human being, for Odom. As we have already discussed previously, that all animals and all plant, everything in the world is for Odom. And Odom is in a category all by himself. And what distinguishes Odom from the other creatures in the world? This is the first thing they have to understand. And as I was explaining, that although animals are much a, a much higher level of life than that of a plant, it, there is a very principle, a very important similarity between them and that is that their life consists in the maintaining of their body their body and their life are one and the same thing and this is why when they were created the Torah says they were actually created body and life simultaneously at one in one moment at the same time it was one creation Odom or Yishin, Odom was created in a different manner completely and that was the, the, what was the sequence of Odom's creation the sequence of Odom's creation was at first his body was formed and then the Torah says, "Vayipach be'apav nishmas chayim." Literally, it means that Hashem blew into his nostrils a breath of life. There is much to be spoken of, much to understand these words, but one principle that we are going to attend to is that his neshama, his life, and his body are two separate creations. They're not one and the same thing. The body is only a vessel, a vehicle for containing the neshama. The body and neshama are not the same thing. The neshama is not only to serve the body to maintain his existence. 
the neshama has a will independent of the body. And as part of, of its duty is also to direct the person for his physical and, and, uh, substance, uh, subsistence, his physical needs. But that is not what defines the neshama as it would be in an animal. There's an interesting <coughs> physical phenomenon that demonstrates this, this concept in the human being. All animals that move, walk, move around, <coughs> there is a physical symmetry in their bodies as what makes them balanced on the ground. Most animals walk on, on four legs. Four legs is a logical <coughs> format for balancing, for being able to, to stand up, for balancing yourself on the ground. The human being walks erect on two feet and his head up. If you think about it, you see that it's totally physically unnatural. Because there is no physical balance. You can't put up a, a, a physical body to stand so firmly just because of its physical structure. What is it then, what we can clearly observe, that keeps a person balanced, it keeps him standing up? He is clearly not dependent on his body. It is his soul, it is the life in him, it is his mind that keeps him in perfect balance. And it keeps him firmly standing. Because the person, the human being, is carried by his soul, not by his body. I said that physically a person stands up not because his body is so perfectly balanced because it's totally irrational it's not it's not natural to stand up like this the reason he stands up like this is because his life his soul is carrying him is holding him up and there is an interesting halacha there's a law that reflects this this factor. The halacha is, you know that Shabbos you're not allowed to carry, you're not allowed to carry to bring out from from the house into the street or carry a certain distance on the street. You're not allowed to carry anything. A human being, on the principle of the halacha, you're allowed to carry. Because Allah, the human being says, "Hachai noisei he carries himself. We, we do not do that because of the rabbanon. We don't do it. You know, practically speaking, we don't do it. But <clears throat> by strict law, the Torah, this, it's, it's not considered carrying. Carrying. It's so. Because one is considered carrying something, a body, that is entirely dependent on its physical makeup. 
to be carried. And therefore, when you, therefore, <coughs> when you carry that, you trans, you, you are carrying the body, you are supporting it. Whereas a human being, his whole stand, when he carries himself, he's not carrying, it's not the body carrying him. It is the Ruchnis, it's the highest, the life in him that carries him. All this is pointing to one important thing. And this is very important that we recognize this. That the human soul is not limited to serving the body. As it is in all other in, in all other creations in the world. Which means it has a purpose of being here in this world independent of the body. Except it has to be in the body because otherwise he wouldn't be in this world. Which simply says to us what Siddha says all over, that the soul comes to this world into the body because it has a mission to accomplish. The soul, the human soul has a mission to accomplish in the physical world. And that's why it's in the body. Coming back to our original question, what does it mean, serving Hashem? <clears throat> when we look at ourselves, as we observe ourselves from a physical perspective, without recognizing the soul that's in us. Although, as we said, it's inescapable. We, we can see it all over. But nevertheless, we don't always recognize, we don't always consciously identify with it and understand what it is about. Then, we look at ourselves, okay, we are a living body. Just like Lahavdul, any animal. And just as a horse is worth its feed only if it can pull a wagon or win a race, so too the human being is there only to prove what he can do with his body. And that becomes his accomplishment in this world. There are also wild horses. That's what, yeah, oh yeah. There are wild horses, there are wild animals. Each animal has its its purpose, why Hashem created it, that's a separate thing. <clears throat> but from our perspective, what fulfills, what gives us a, a sense of accomplishment, that which we can prove with having accomplishment, having accomplished, having done and created something in this world. That gives us a place, that gives us a, a, a recognition. Which means that essentially we have to fight for our place in the world. But the Torah says differently. Says differently. The Torah says that the soul, the neshama that's in us, is a breath of God. We're not going to go, you know, into the philosophy of understanding what that means. But one thing, as we said before, there is a real life in us. A real life means a real <coughs> meaningful um, force, a living force that is that does not need to be justified and be to be created. 
that itself, the living in this world for a human being, as mentioned in the previous times, the human being as a creation is a representative of God in the world. Every creature is representing a worldly phenomenon. The human being is representing the uh, godly phenomenon. As we pointed out from the fact that the human being walks in a manner that is clearly attesting to his spiritual force. When we come to doing things, and quite often we sit down and we want to learn, or we have to learn, and we turn around and say, I'm not motivated to learn. I don't feel accomplished by learning. This is when we are viewing our activity as a physical activity. Viewing our what? Our activity as a physical activity. So, okay, if I learn or I study something which would allow me to be subsequently creative in the world, then I feel that I have accomplished something. But if I learn, if I learn to, if I learn the, the, the presence, about the presence and the truth of Hashem in the world, <clears throat> where is my accomplishment in the world? And if I don't see my accomplishment in the world, I don't, see, I don't feel fulfilled. I don't feel that I, I'm doing anything. This is a serious problem that many of us encounter. And for this, it is necessary that we should reflect and understand what in fact are we doing? What is the motivating factor behind this activity? All our activities, as a matter of fact. The Gemara says, Call Yisrael the name Elohim Heim. All Eden are by nature princes. The name Elohim. They're by nature princes. This has a profound message. What is the nature of a prince? The nature of a prince is that he, in terms of, of his presence, in terms of his, of his survival, <clears throat> in terms of his being, he never knew of any lack. He never lacks anything. He's never concerned about upkeep, about his existence. That is not part of his psyche. He does not have such thing as, as missing anything. So here is this prince, who is a human being with, with all the human capacity, all human uh, uh, faculties. And there is nothing motivating him to work. Because he's not, he's not lacking anything. He only has to do is just whisper, can I have 
a shot of whiskey? It flies right into his mouth. So, he's like nothing. What is the motivating, what's motivating the prince? You have an answer? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Really good. The child wants to be like his father. So what the only I think that the only uh, goal that we want is to be or to be next to our father. That is Hashem. So in order to whatever we are doing, you say that the the pride, the the, the, the prince is like uh, don't do anything because he has already everything when he does that. Well, he I think that he works harder maybe than the the lower people because he wants to be in the highest level for his, his father. For example, my father is the, is the owner of the company. And Excuse me? If my father, for example, is a owner of the company. Right. And I want to be, in a few years, when I'm going to be older, I want to be, I don't know, the vice president. In order to be a vice president, then be president, I have to be working harder to reach that level. That after a few years, it's going to be... Yeah, but, okay. but you have to understand that your father is an owner of a company. Why is he running a company? Why? What? Why, does Why he is he running a company? Well, for example, a company of service, the telephone service. He's giving a service. Regarding, why is he running the company? He's running the company because he has to support himself. Right. The king. <coughs> the concept of a prince, the concept of a king, it has to be a, properly understood because it really pertains to us. Because the motivation of a prince is not due to any lack, not due to any consequences in case he doesn't do it. What then motivates a prince? The motivation of a prince is his belief and his insight of a certain value. Because he recognizes a certain value, he recognizes the, the goodness of a certain thing, and therefore he is motivated to, to pursue it. But then there is even more than that. <coughs> the prince is lives in the king's domain lives in the king's in the king's palace and the, and the, the palace is is uh, the the center of his of his uh, land of his country not recognizing any shortcoming, any lack. What is the prince seeing? The prince is constantly exposed to one thing. The greatness of his country. The greatness of the king. Not the possible shortcomings, the possible fall down. But rather the positive. The prince is aware only of the greatness of this king. So therefore, what motivates the prince? <coughs> because he recognizes the greatness and the beauty of the king. And the country is representative of his kingdom. Therefore, the prince has only one thing in mind, to, a, to enhance and to show the greatness of the king that it should be recognized in the country. His objective is to beautify this land 
so that the land would be properly representative of his of the king. He is always is only so to speak involved in internal decoration because otherwise there is no there are, there is no it's not vulnerable to anything. It's not concerned about vulnerability. It's concerned about bringing out all the beauty that is that is possible in this land because it's a land that is representative and is ruled by the king. In other words, the prince is only concerned about the positive, about the enhancement, about the ruchnius. In the human being, we say that Hebrew are the name of What does that mean? They are princes. There is a physical part in the person and there is a spiritual part in the person. The physical part, this is where all kinds of different problems are possible. The body is vulnerable to physical effects. The spiritual part, the neshama, the soul, is not vulnerable. The soul is always whole. What is the essential motivation of the of this prince for action? Since he is lacking nothing, the motivation for this prince is to show the more to show and reveal this perfection that is in his soul. Just as the prince is only involved, the physical prince is only involved, its only concern is to show the perfection of this kingdom, of his king, so too is the human being Ayit, his preoccupation as a prince, it's under Nishoma. What motivates his, his activity is to show and to reveal the goodness and, the, and, and the, the purity and the wealth that is contained in his Hashem. Therefore, when we sit down for an activity, whether it is learning, davening, Whatever. Our objective is not that since I don't know anything and since I don't know anything or I don't know as much as I should know or I don't know as much as I could know therefore I am not really fulfilled, I'm not really um, in my place in the world. So therefore, there has to be motivation. In other words, the motivation comes from the negative. I'm lacking. I have to fight for my place in the world. I have to fight for my right of being, for my respect. And this is where it sets in and says, ah, oh, it's too hard. I don't care what they think about me. I'd rather sleep. In other words, it's a motivation that comes from the negative. And then, and the more negative it is, the less motivated the person feels and the, and, and the more discouraged it becomes. But what we have to recognize, what we have to find, is the, this, the neshama motivation. That when we want to do something, we want to sit down to learn, we want to sit down to learn because we already have the neshama. 
we already spiritually fully alive. And what we want is to reveal that Neshomi in our mind. To reveal that Neshomi in our hearts. This is the essential motivation, the essential impetus in 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 Aiden's activity. Because he is by nature a prince. So if you come to him and say, hey, you better do such and such, otherwise there's going to be a consequence, he turns off. That's not that's not that's not the way he thinks of himself. He thinks of himself as perfect, as lacking nothing. And he can't accept this type of negativity. Yes, as we spoke many times, there is a a little bit of an animal in the person, there is a human in the person, we have to know how to speak to the animal, but I'm talking about the person, the real person, the Nishoma, the human, or even the godly. This is why when we wake up in the morning, the first words we say is Moide Ani Lefonecho Melachai Vakaim Shekozate Binishmos. The first word we say is to acknowledge, to recognize, and to reflect, as a matter of fact. Who are we? What what does it mean I woke up? I woke up means that Hashem has restored the Nishoma in me. And therefore, who am I? What am I? I am this glorious prince that has this, this God in Nishoma. Just as we have to deal with our Yetzer Hora, with our evil part, with our Bahama part, we also have to recognize our human part and our godly part. We cannot ignore the fact that we yes, we do have we do have negativity, we do have a, a Bahama um, in us as we'll be discussed before and we will still discuss another time. But we cannot deal with it exclusively at that level. Because there is also the human being in us. And the human being, the Nishama, has to have a sense and motivation all on its own. And what motivates the Nishama? The motivation for the Nishama, this is what we call avoid us Hashem. This is the meaning of avoid us Hashem. Avoid us service. Service to Hashem. Because, just as in the illustration of the prince, the neshama, the human neshama, as a person when he wakes up, is is perfect. He lacks nothing. And the minute he starts thinking about all, all the duties and all the problems he has, where is it all coming from? I'm perfect. I, he can't re- or reorient himself with it. He can't relate to it. It's all coming from left field. Because in fact, it is from left field. There are two separate aspects in a person's life. He has to attend to his worldly duties and to all the various pleasure, uh, pressures. But he must never forget of who he is in truth.
and in that in that capacity, in that sense, in that in that perspective, <coughs> the only thing that's meaningful to him is avoid the Hashem, which means accomplishment, building himself up. I don't see the need for it. Who am I? But when you tell him that by his learning another mission, he's learning a posit chumash, he is thereby bringing and allowing this godly neshama that's in him to to affect and to and to and have his his brain and his body also relate to it and understand that he understands. This is called avodas Hashem. Avodas Hashem means to bring Hashem into the world. And by any anything that we do that is essentially a representation of our Nishomu, that this is a way to somebody bring Hashem into the world. It doesn't have to be any kind of accomplishment in terms of recognition, in terms of of being creative in the world. It has to be, it is a separate and independent uh, um, uh, experience of the prince that's in us. This prince, this neshama, is indestructible. This is the neshama that carried our people throughout all the ages, throughout any difficult situations. Because it's an indestructible sense that we are for real. That there is a there is a God in the To illustrate this point, when the Russian Jews faced the, the, the challenge of teaching their children olive base, and they knew very well that Yes, I can teach my child olive base now in the in the confines, so to speak, of our in behind the wall, but eventually what's gonna be? What hope is there that that he is going to be able to proceed from olive base into the first grade and into and into being a full Ayid who knows who knows what to live like Ayid? Absolutely zero. There was no hope. No possibility. So therefore, if there's no possibility, that means that accomplishment is impossible. You can't hope, oh, I'm going to teach him all of this, and eventually he's going to be a lamb, he's going to be a rogue, he's going to be a, um, a, a Rosh Hashiva. It's not going to be anything. This is not going to accomplish anything. What then is the meaning of this learning of this hour of days? The meaning of this alibis is that for this moment he experiences his neshama. It's not a question of of of, um, of of long long-term accomplishment. It's for the moment. At this moment, he is actually experiencing and you know, living like a heat. And this is an indestructible force in him. (laughs) 
this basically is the way our day is structured according to the Shulchan Aruch. According to the Shulchan Aruch, as I mentioned before, you wake up, you start with Moidan. Moidan is simply defines to you who you are and gives you a perspective. What does it mean I woke up? Then I wake up in the physical world. Then I wake up because my body is not rested, like hardly an animal, or there's some other phenomenon. And we are immediately reminded, no, the main thing of the waking up is the fact that we have the Nishon. And with this, this Nishon is what carries us. With this Nishon, this is how we wake up and get off our beds. This is what picks us up. It's not the fact that I'm not tired anymore. What gets us out of our bed is this neshama. Just like the neshama carries us when we walk, that's the neshama that carries us out and, and springs us out of our beds. And then, what is apiseidah shechonoruch apid, according to the daily order of ayit? What does he pursue after that? The first thing is davening. Even someone who is not a yeshiva bachur and who has to go to work and, and he is pressed for time, he has to come on time to his office and so forth, the first thing he has to do is that. What's davening? Davening is essentially to establish and to bring the nishama in full view and full experience in the, in the, in the person. That's what the Dabni is. So that when he subsequently goes out to work and goes out into the world, he he is carried there still by his Nishomi. He still has a real life in, in, in himself. <laughs> the objective that I have in this talk is because in speaking to many, uh, many here and otherwise, we very often simply lose sense of what we're doing. Of what we are doing. We think in terms of some kind of a measurable accomplishment. And then we get discouraged. And we have to understand that a Eden's a Jewish life, a Eden's life every day. There is no such thing as one day is just being a preparatory. You're going to school in order to graduate so that then you'll be able to do something. Now that's so. Every day is a purpose all unto itself. All unto itself. It's a purpose in itself. It's an end in itself. The real, as we spoke one time before, the real accomplishment that we get from our from our period in the yeshiva is not measured in terms of how much we have learned and how much we know, but rather how much of this Nishoma quality did we recognize? To me? That's right. To what extent have we recognized that there is a Nishoma in us? 
because what you learn will serve you well but if you don't practice it you can have to forget it learning is an ongoing process but recognizing this neshama this gives you life this carries you through through everything this is what really prepares you for life just like Moida Ani wakes you up in the morning and gets you out of bed the preparation of the yeshiva gets you into the world in a way that it can carry you through so that you can walk erect and not fall down and not be discouraged by anything that happens because you have a real life in you you have the sense of what's called avoidas Hashem you have just like the prince is aware of the greatness of the king and all that he wants is to express that greatness so too is every year the prince who wants to who's aware of the greatness of the king and he wants to express that greatness and if you examine the tefillah if you examine the davening how the Chachomim have set up the davening you will see that essentially most of the davening consists precisely in that in expressing in recognizing the greatness of Hashem's creation how Hashem what Hashem has done in the world with this approach to whatever extent we recognize it we will be able to carry us through under any circumstance and will also motivate us day in day out even though that today we are first repeating what we learned yesterday and I find that I forgot some words so what have I accomplished I'm so discouraged you have forgotten some words maybe but the experience of learning it you haven't forgotten The, the, the highest, the neshama, yeah, it cannot be forgotten. It's not this fancy drink, it's plain water. Yeah. I hope you know, that everyone will continue to to be self motivating and be able to pull himself out of any discouragement on a continuous basis. You have to remember that you're a prince. And as such, you are here to, as the Rebbe says, to illuminate the world, to bring light into the world. And every every time that you understand Shema Yisroel, you bring another, you light another candle.
after it dies, can an animal... An animal into a human being? At a later point in time. No, an animal always remains an animal. No, an animal doesn't reincarnate. And some of an animal doesn't doesn't have the afterlife. Its life is limited to its body. There's no body, there's no life. Only a human being has an shoulder, independent of the goof. Yeah. Uh, is there any way to measure this, you know, this process of, let's say, to learn, right? And we're from just the process of learning, we're supposed to somehow bring the, you know, how to illuminate the physical with the Buddha and Yashama. Is there a way to measure this process? I mean, are we doing it and we're not doing it? Are we doing it, uh, you know, we're accomplishing, are we actually doing this? Uh, you know what I mean? How do you sometimes, you know, you learn and you don't know and you're not doing it correctly? Well, the Alter Rebbe explains in Tanya that that one dabbles in the morning, and during davening, he is fully involved in the davening. Assume that he is. And he recognizes all the, the you know, the, the godliness that is revealed and that is expressed in davening. And he's truly, he truly lives with it. Then he finishes davening, and he goes into business. He goes into the world. So what happens now, he has, he has experienced it, but now he's in a totally different environment, totally different mindset, and he's no longer involved in the same thing. So there are two things. First he says that there is a trace, is the effect of the davening still remains with him. How do we see it? Like you said, how do we measure it? We measure it in the following factor that if any time during the day he has a moment and he stops and he reflects on those in Yonim, on those thoughts that, that he had gone through in Dabnik, he finds that they come to him much more easily than when he first had to develop them. In other words, he can relate to the truths, to the to the insights and to the feeling that he had in davening much more readily. He just has to remind himself of it and he is and he kind of experiences it. That itself shows that there was a lasting effect. Surely he has to remind himself, no it's not that he's not a tzaddik, you know, not in the high madrigas. But even a simple person, the very fact that he can we live it in an easy way, that itself shows that there was a, there was a real effect. So if you're asking in the long term, how do we know that we are going in the right direction, that we are actually having that effect? If it is easier today than yesterday, then it means that it, it's having an effect. If, as we said before, if Moida Anil of today has more meaning than it had yesterday, that means that yesterday's activity had had an effect. Provided that yesterday there was a, there was a sincere Moida So let's start from today or from tomorrow morning. And then you will see that if every day in the morning you say Moida Ani, thinking of what you're saying, you'll find that three days later it has a totally different meaning to you. It really, really, really literally gets you out of bed. So is the 
the same way with learning, let's say, if we learn a particular sifa or whatever mimer, I mean, is it kind of the same like during the day? It makes you think about the concept that you've learned, and so basically that's pretty much how you measure that you've that gotten into it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's different, it's new in the sense that it's real living. I don't know exactly where your question is leading. You see, you have to understand Life, if you really think and understand what life is, what the Neshama is, we will see that life does not have to be different in order to be new. In the physical world, if I'm repeating the same thing, oh, I, I already tasted it. I want something else. But living, you never get tired of living. Every instant of life is as new as this is the first moment I'm experiencing. The important thing is that we should pay attention and experience it. We never wake up in the morning and say, oh, I woke up yesterday. So why do you wake up today again? <laughs> doesn't exist. It doesn't exist not only because we're not that cynical, but because it's just, it's just not real. Because life is new all the time. Just want to tell you that this concept, <coughs> there is like, like any uh, everything else that we mentioned today. <coughs> there is much written about it. I mean, this is not this is just a nutshell, just a cursory look at it. But there there is much insight and much explanation to all of this. And the, the more you learn, the more, of course, you understand and know. <clears throat> but in the principle, this this is the answer to your question. Yes. Yes, you would. Uh, you know, I find sometimes in the morning that uh, you know when I say the prayer, if I you know I have days that I do a real with passion, you know, and then I get days that just you know I just can't get it. You know, I mean, it just it just doesn't go in. You know, and even if I try or I force it or just doesn't get grasped the same essence yet. So this is not exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Because your aim is not that you should go in, you should go up to it. Do you, do you, do you send what I'm saying to you? Yeah, it's just, uh, you have to elevate yourself and say, you know, <coughs> it's not the body that I'm talking about. I'm talking about my real self. And the because I see people, because everybody's different, of course. They come from different story, they have different way to be educated, and uh, I'm, I'm very emotional. So the time that if, uh, like, I have my day that I, that I got my five minutes, I call it the five minutes, then I become a comedian, you know, <laughs> I'm all over the place. But uh, then I have days that, you know, that uh, I feel more like a you know, everything is not quite in the right direction. That is, there's not that, that uh, like you were saying before, the connection between the, you know, to have the, the enthusiasm to do things, you know. 
it's very hard. It's very hard to put it on the contest, you know, uh, on the contest of where you, what really, where really you are and where you want to go. But I honestly believe that you do not know where you are going until you do not know where you're going. That's basically the meaning. But sometimes it's hard. That's all I'm saying. Right, right, right. Yes. Yes. Nothing frees us from challenges. Right. But we can always step back. Overcome. 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 And we always have to remember that we always will have the capacity to overcome. Yeah. Nothing can drown us. Thank you. Okay. That's that God's God's trick. But the connect is so no. Yeah. How? I don't know, he he worked it out somehow. No. You, you, you say, uh, the Shikhanara says that the soul connecting to the body is a miracle. But we need to do what he say our soul. We don't have to do anything. God connects the soul to the body. But it's a miracle. Yeah. But, but, you know, to me, my, my main difficulty is when, you know, when you get uh, uh, with people, like for example, last time we were at the wedding, so when we go to a wedding, it means that it's a joyful and happiness moment, I mean, happy, happy moment, you know. So sure you was the, last night. Yeah, you have the Hasidic way to show it, like, you know, we had uh, Mike Oil, the jump over the place, uh, the, they jump over the place, uh, the, the turning around. The what about the tears are amazing? Oh, that was great. How about yeah, the put it on top of the table. It was beautiful. That guy is so pure. It's unbelievable. So, what I'm saying is, sometimes I go in the middle of people, right? And I'm a, by nature a comedian. That's what I, by nature. By nature I'm just a sport, right? If you do it with not vulgarity, it's the difference between being happy and being a vulgar person. A vulgar people forget about it because I'm not. I know that for sure, right? But sometimes you get enthusiastic, you know? and people cannot understand it. They look at you like you're a, you're a nutcase. There is not a world in the Torah that says that you have to accept a serve a chef with a, you know, to be miserable, to be too serious. What is the definition between happy and serious? There is none. I mean, till you do the things and you don't cross the line, or what is a chef tell you to do, you should be happy. I mean, if a person is happy around you, what should you should. It should bring you uh, uh, what you call happiness. Sometimes I look at uh, some of you guys that study for years and, and you are heritage soon, and I feel very elevated about it. So look at this guy. I, I am here. If I could have that peace, that, that knowledge, you understand? But sometimes people go by what is the, the image of that person, not the essence of the person. Did I make uh, my confusion? Uh, here in Seagate, People oh, yeah, are confusing it I mean, for, for, for the image, for, for, for essence. Here, only essence. Right. The image doesn't count. Because at all. after all, the, the, the Hasidic movement, movement, especially the Rubavitch, was born to bring Torah with joyfulness. That's right. With happiness and uh, uh, singing the Gun and dancing. And I don't see anything in the Torah that says, you know, you have to be sad. That You're absolutely you right. And they shouldn't. Good. You're right. So, Step me straight now. <laughs> <laughs> no more comedy. Oh, watch, 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 watch. You're pulling the wrong way.